no company today can afford to lose data, or at least has a very low interest in losing data. Therefore, uh, companies and researchers have developed sophisticated backup systems to prevent this data loss. Data deduplication is a very popular technique used in uh, backup systems, and its purpose is to compress the backed up data first before it is written to disk. The traditional view to these deduplication systems is that they consist of a set of inherently linked characteristics, and these systems could only work with this specific combination of these characteristics. However, if you take a closer look, you see that there are core concepts which are independent from each other. In the first part of our work, we perform this uncoupling and identification of these core concepts and um, develop a model based on that. This model yields two things. First, it showed us two yet unexplored systems, two yet unexplored combinations of these concepts. And second, it allowed us to perform an evaluation which focuses on these core concepts. In the second part of our work, we perform this evaluation based on the main representatives of the deduplication systems. So, but how, uh, how does deduplication work in detail? Well, the first steps are roughly the same for each system. The idea is to cut the input data into pieces, the so-called chunks, and then try to identify whether you have seen these chunks in the past or not. In detail, the input data was first chunked into, um, into chunks of the size of between uh, 4 kilobytes and, ki um, and 16 kilobytes. Um, and next, the system computes chunk fingerprints based on, um, based on these chunks, on, on this chunk raw data. This is usually a SHA-1 hash. Next, each system performs the chunk identification based on these fingerprints. And if the chunk is new, the uh, chunk raw data is put into so-called containers, and if a container gets full, it is then put to disk. However, this was the writing part. Um, since it's a backup system, well, it uh, of course has to be able to, re um, to deliver this data back. For this pur um, purpose, um, systems generate recipes, which are basically the uh, construction information of um, the backup data. In the very easiest case, it's just a list of um, the list of uh, the fingerprints of the just created chunks. The chunk identification is the core um, part of each deduplication system where these systems differ from each other. A system designer has to uh, do two basic decisions. First, how to detect old chunks. Second, how to detect new chunks. Both questions could be answered by maintaining one big index, the so-called chunk index, which then would hold for each stored chunk a mapping from its chunk fingerprint to the location on disk where this chunk raw data is stored. However, the problem is that this index becomes too big for main memory uh, so that it has to reside on disk, at least partially, and there it generates a very, very unfavorable I.O. access pattern because of the random nature of the chunk fingerprints. Therefore, designers usually try to exploit uh, locality um, properties and these localities um, are um, delivered by the chunks themselves because they have the tendency to occur and reoccur together. Um, this locality is usually caught in two places, first the containers and second in, in the recipes. Container caching is one system which works with containers and the idea is pretty simple, just cache the metadata part of uh, the containers and um, then for each new incoming chunk fingerprint, first check this container cache, whether it has an entry for this fingerprint. If not, check the chunk index and if the chunk index has an entry, get the container, re read it and um, put the metadata into the cache. And this works pretty well. In our evaluation, it generated a hit ratio of uh, more than 99%. However, it doesn't work for um, Bloomfield, uh, doesn't work for new chunks, 
since uh, new chunks um, are guaranteed to miss the cache and therefore always hit the chunk index. Therefore, the authors um, included a bloom filter, which filters out these um, accesses. Block locality caching is a system which works with recipes instead. Um, the idea here is that a backup actually is very similar to its, uh, its predecessor. So, in theory, you could for, um, compute for your current position in um, your currently running um, backup the according position in the last, back, um, in the last backup and prefetch the recipes which, were, which have been generated at that point and then try to identify the chunks um, based on these recipes. And this also works pretty well, also generates um, hit ratios of above 99%. But here again, uh, new chunks um, are guaranteed to miss each time, so there has to be a bloom fit. Sparse indexing also works with recipes, but in contrast to the other systems, does not hold a full chunk index and instead samples this chunk index so that it is small enough to fit into main memory. The chunk identification then roughly goes as follows. First, the input data is chunked and fingerprinted as before, and the newly created chunks are collected in um, a so-called segment structure. And when this one reaches a certain size, which is roughly after 20 megabytes, the system tries to identify the most similar old segments and then, try and then fetches the recipes of these most similar segments and um, compares these recipes to the just created segment. The problem here is that this leads to an approximate uh, deduplication as um, the fetched recipes are not guaranteed to cover every redundant chunk in the, uh, in the just created segment. In the beginning, I mentioned that we identified the core concepts. In detail, we focused on two. The first one is the prefetching and caching scheme. That is the technique with which each approach tries to identify redundant chunks in an I.O. efficient manner. In our opinion, this is what actually defines a deduplication approach. The second one is the deduplication precision, so exact and approximate deduplication, that is whether, it's, um, whether a system identifies each redundant chunk. And you can, you can combine these two concepts arbitrarily, and I will show this um, how to uh, convert each of these systems along the exact and approximate deduplication axis on the next slides. For container caching, this is pretty easy. The prefetching caching scheme is to identify the containers, load them from the container storage, and cache uh, them even with the help of um, the entries of the chunk index. To make it an approximate version, you just, simp uh, you just simply um, sample the chunk index. In the best case, even so much that it fits into main memory. For block locality caching, this is exactly the same. Sample the chunk index so that it fits into main memory, and then um, try to um, identify, still try to identify the chunks based on the fetched recipes. For sparse indexing, we have to create an exact version, and we chose, uh, chose to do so um, by adding a full-size chunk index, which then resides on disk. We could have um, blow up the sparse index into a full-sized uh, chunk index, but however, we think that this is an important part of the prefetching scheme. You just need an in-memory based uh, structure to um, determine the most similar uh, segments. With this little discussion, we um, developed two yet unexplored combinations, namely the exact sparse indexing and the approximate block locality caching. 
In addition, we can now perform this. Um, uh, we can now perform an evaluation which focuses on the core mechanism of each deduplication system, namely the container caching or the block, uh, the block locality caching and the sparse indexing. We perform this evaluation based on four uh, data sets. The first three are weekly backups from two different um, universities. In this case, um, the backup data, data consists of home uh, directories. The last one consists of backups from desktop computers from Microsoft. For each combination, for each system, we gave the system uh, the same amount of main memory. And our metric was to um, count the number of IOs each approach uses to identify chunks. But since uh, the data sets have a different size, we normalized it, so we computed the number of IOs per 1,000 chunks. Here you can see an overview of the uh, generated IOs. For the exact versions, there is no clear winner, but one clear loser. Um, exact sparse indexing generates at least one orders of magnitude more IOs than the other two approaches. And the reason is that we haven't included a bloom filter there. And we have chosen so to, um, chosen so because we wanted to keep close, uh, to get, to, to stay close to the original approach. However, 99% of all generated IOs are caused by new chunks and these would have been prevented with a bloom filter. For the approximate versions, there also is no clear winner. The best approach varies among the data set. However, container caching has a special role here because it uh, can cover the full UPB data set. You can, um, or its cache can cover the full set. You cannot see the same effect for the other approaches because they cache recipes and the amount um, and the volume of recipes grows with the volume and amount of logically written data to the backup system, to the deduplication system. While the amount of containers increases with the volume of actually written data to disk, that is the amount of data after deduplication. The number of IOs is one important uh, metric for the performance of a system, but the actual X pattern also is an important one. And this is what we dig in next. Here you can see the access pattern um, of container caching to its um, containers. In detail, you can see for each fetch operation within one backup, the ID of the fetched container. If the system stores the containers sequentially on disk, the optimal access pattern would be a monotonically increasing line. And container caching has such a line, but also a lot of um, IOs or fetches um, beside that line. Sparse indexing has two sequential accesses, namely uh, first, and this is the upper line, accesses to recipes of segments which were generated in the current backup generation, and second, accesses to se um, segments which were generated during the last backup generations, and between them a lot of um, random I.O. Block locality caching has one sequential access, namely um, access to recipes of blocks which were generated in the last backup generation. And this actually is what um, block locality caching was made for, namely computing an, al alignment, um, an, al an alignment to the last backup generation and um, uh, work with the recipes which were generated there. This figure um, basically shows that um, this approach works as intended. However, there are still some random accesses. A few slides ago, I mentioned that we gave each system the same amount of main memory. In detail, it was eight gigabytes. However, this is a little bit small compared to what you can get in today's servers. Um, but this gave us a reasonable cache size to data set size ratio. And actually, even these eight gigabytes were a little bit too much. 
um, as you have seen for container caching and the um, first data set. However, today you can get servers and systems with more than 128 gigabytes. So we played around with that number and um, redid the um, evaluation for the approximate versions. Here you can see how they behave for different memory sizes. The solid lines show the average number of IOs per 1000 chunks. The dashed lines show the average ratio of undetected duplicates. And this ratio is what is affected first if you change the main memory. As each halving of um, the main memory roughly doubles the sampling of the, um, of the sparse index and therefore gives the approaches only half as many recipes and ha or half as many um, containers to work with to identify chunks. Here, um, block locality caching shines for very low uh, main memory situations. For 256 megabytes, it does not detect up to 5% of um, all duplicates, while container caching does not detect up to uh, 42%, which renders this approach absolutely unusable um, in, uh, for uh, real-world scenarios. However, on the other side of the spectrum, the uh, ratio of undetected duplicates is very, very small, and the difference is too small to make a difference. Here, container caching shines um, as its cache covers the full data set. Um, this also happens with the other approaches. Um, sparse indexing um, holds everything in main memory between 32 and 64 gigabytes in this case for block locality caching. Um, this happens at a later point. However, they still generate IOs because our rule was that each generated container, each generated uh, recipe has to be fetched from disk at least once before it uh, resides in the cache. Um, another interesting aspect here is that um, sparse indexing and container caching uh, become worse when they get um, more memory first. Well, the reason is that a uh, highly sampled index gives um, only rarely a hint to a, a recipe or a container, and therefore the systems um, usually have nothing to fetch from disk. As the index becomes uh, more dense, um, it, uh, um, they fetch more from disk, disk, therefore the number of um, IOs increases. Block locality caching is nearly unaffected here, uh, um, the reason is that it holds a small cache of guest alignments, which it tries first before it um, queries the sampled index. And uh, these IOs dominate over the others. So what can we learn from this? First, deduplication systems are not a set of inherently linked characteristics. Actually, they, are, uh, they consist of a set uh, of independent core concepts, and you can combine these arbitrarily. We have shown this with the prefetching and caching approaches and the deduplication precision. In the evaluation, the original approaches Perform, uh, perform good, they, um, which shows that the original author, authors did a good job. However, the new approaches have their interesting uh, aspects and outperform the um, original pro uh, approaches in, in, in some corner cases. For example, block locality, uh, block locality caching in low main memory scenarios and container caching in high main memory scenarios um, so, if you have a lot of memory and for some reason you can predict um, that uh, the amount of um, backup data you will see in the future is comparable small, then I would go for that solution. Um, this is it from my side. Thank you for listening. I'm open to questions. <laughs>
<laughs> or it's just too early. <laughs> okay, we'll give one more hand to. Uh, All right, thank you.